This is the temple of Konarak in the state of Orissa, on the east coast of India. The dancer is performing Orisi, a dance form that draws its inspiration from the ancient temple sculptures of this region. This dancer is an example of how India's traditions are being changed and influenced by the modern world. Whereas the technology of the jet engine has carried performers and artists from India to audiences across the world, Sharon Lowen is an American who has traveled to India to seek a new form of expression. <laughs> Originally, I'm from Michigan. I grew up in Detroit, and I spent uh, six years in Ann Arbor at the university there. And then when I returned to the States from India, I lived in Southern California. Then I was back in India for a few years, then in Michigan. And since then, I spent about half the time in India and half the time in the States. I always danced, but I trained primarily in modern dance and ballet, as well as other theater forms. I did a lot of puppetry. But I had a lot of connection to India through friends and Indian functions, seeing Satyajit Roy films. And as I explored different dance forms, I got more interested in Indian dance. I think that because I was trained as a modern dancer, we look to other forms because you can use whatever vocabulary you have. And it's very much part of the modern dance tradition to use other movement. In fact, in the 19th century uh, or the beginning of the 20th century, when artists were looking for an alternative to the conventions of, of the classical ballet of the time, they very much looked to the East and to India for the kind of grounded movement and different sorts of movement, movement with meaning and more content than the, the dance of that time. So in some sense, I was continuing that tradition when I came to India to study. As I got involved, I realized that nine months in a classical form is really a waste of time unless I stayed longer. So nine months became two years, and that became five years. And then I decided I'd rather continue with Indian dance instead of going back to the modern. Sharon is dancing on the Natya Manda, which is a platform built specifically for dancers in the temple of Konarak. Konarak, dedicated to Surya, the sun god, was built in the mid-15th century by King Narasimha and was the grandest achievement of the kingdom of Kalinga. 350 years after it was built, Abul Fazl, a Muslim historian, was moved to eulogize about a Hindu temple. He says, even those whose judgment is critical and who are difficult to please stand amazed at the sight. But the concept of the temple proved too great a task for its builders. Before the upper part of the tower could be put into position, the foundations began to give way. Kunarak is and always has been a magnificent ruin, but the sculpture that adorns its walls is among the finest in India. Chiseled rock seems like molded clay as it depicts tales of gods, lovers, dancers and musicians. Their fluid lines the source and inspiration of the Orisi dance style. But there is even earlier evidence of Orissa's dance tradition. Statues of dancers can be seen at the Rani Gumpha Theatre. Inscriptions at the theatre indicate it was built in the 2nd century BC. The king at the time was intent on providing a variety of entertainments for his people. Dancers performed on the first floor of this theatre. The king and queen watched from one side and musicians sat on the other. 
The type of dance performed then is a matter of speculation. It is not until much later that evidence of Orisi as danced by Sharon can be traced. Well, we know that there was dance in Orissa from the second century BC. But from the ninth century, we have a tradition of dancing girls dedicated to service in the temples. Odissi dance is basically devotional and was an offering for the gods. So the dancer is performing as a heavenly being. style is very lyrical, very sculpturesque. The poses look very much as what you see on the temple in Kanarak. It has soft movements, lasya, and vigorous or masculine movements, tanda. Another important point of the Odissi is that you combine abstract dance with expressional or dramatic dance. We have all of the body parts moving uh, together but we study them separately. There are neck movements, side, side, corners, eye movements, a lot of expression, torso movement, especially sideways. The hands are used, mudras are used both for abstract movement where it's just decorative and also with meaning. <laughs> keep the rhythm so that's going on while the top part moves in a very lyrical way and also we stay in a very uh, bent position very close to the earth when we dance now once we do the uh, connect all of these parts you have the movements for the pure dance but the main point of Odissi is to move the audience through the dramatic expression in the Natya Shastra, the 6th century text on Indian dance and drama, it says that where the hand goes, the eye should follow. Where the eye goes, the mind will go. There will be the emotion, and there will be the rasa. Rasa is the essence, the flavor of it. And evoking rasa is the main point of Indian dance and of Odissi, to evoke a metaphysical state in the artist and in the audience. The temple of Konarak is shaped like a giant chariot and between its wheels one finds the historical and spiritual beginnings of the dance. Purists in India have criticized foreigners who have adopted Indian dance of secularizing an act of Hindu worship. How does Sharon, who is Jewish, feel about this? When I was uh, actually doing a Manipuri performance in a temple in Manipur, I thought, this is it. Uh, when I kneel down in front of this deity, if lightning is going to strike, it'll be now. But it didn't happen. So I decided that even in, in, uh, in Hinduism, there are tens of thousands of gods. And yet they also come down to one. So if one believes in one God, it doesn't really matter uh, what the personification is. It's the same thing. So if an actress is portraying a particular role, she can focus on whatever that character is. So I can take this image of Jagannath, which in one sense is just a, a wooden figure. But if I focus on it as a representative of the divine, then I can have the same feeling for that that, that anyone would have for any uh, concept or image. Orissa today is a pale shadow of its former self. 
It is one of the most backward states in India, predominantly rural, plagued by poverty and illiteracy. Ragu Rajpur is in many ways a typical Oriya village. It is a two-mile walk from the nearest metal road. It is lucky to have an electricity supply, albeit of dubious reliability, and one well which provides water to drink, wash, cook and clean. But Ragu Rajpur is unique in that it is one of India's time capsules. For centuries it has been home to a community of painters who have passed on their skills from teacher to pupil. The teacher and chief artist today is Guru Jagannath Mohapatra and his pupils are local boys. Girls are never encouraged to take up such vocations. They learn mainly by doing in the presence of their master. They paint on stiffened cloth with colors which are made from powdered stone. They also etch intricate designs on dried palm leaves which are tied together in slats. The pictures echo those seen on the walls of Konarak, but mainly they depict the adventurers, amorous and otherwise, of Krishna. Of the thousands of gods and legends of Hinduism, Krishna and his antics are perhaps the most popular. His adolescent flirtation with the milkmaids is a constant source of inspiration for painters and poets in all of India's lands and languages. To Sharon Lowen, as an Orissi dancer, Krishna is just as important. He is often the subject of her dance performances. This is the story of Krishna stealing the clothes from the milkmaids, the gopis. The milkmaids came to the water, they put down their pots for water or curd, took off their clothes and went in the water. Then Krishna came with his flute, stole the clothes, hung them up in the tree, and then played his flute to announce that he was there. When they saw their clothes were gone, they begged him to give them back. But he said that he would only return them if they opened their arms. This is a, a metaphor because all of these stories have a double meaning. It's not only Krishna and the milkmaids, but actually God, God and the devotees. So you cannot come with clothes before God. You can't hide anything. So they have to open their arms. When they do so, Krishna gives them back their clothes. In dance, the gopis carrying their pots on their hip, put down the pot, go to the river, see that nobody is looking, take off their clothes, put them aside, go into the water, enjoy, play with each other. Then Krishna, with his flute, comes and sees that no one is looking, uses his flute to pick up the clothes, pull them, and then he throws them to the top of the trees. Then, very pleased with himself, he plays his flute. Meanwhile, the gopis reach for their clothes, and when they're not there, they search. They ask each other, have you seen them? Then they see Krishna up in the tree, and they're very shy. He's always teasing. Then they say, please. But when he says they must open their arms, then they give up their pride, open their arms in devotion, and then he gives the clothes. This palm leaf painting portrays Dashavatar, the ten incarnations of Lord Vishnu, as he comes to earth to save the world from destruction. In the center, you see him as Krishna, playing his flute, entwined with Radha, his consort, the gopis, the milkmaids, are paying obeisance, offering pan on either side. Well, in the first incarnation, the primordial flood, there's a terrible flood. The earth is covered with water, and a demon steals the Vedas, the sacred texts. Vishnu comes and saves them for you and you and me. Vishnu with his beautiful earrings, comes as the fish, Matsya, and saves the text. Fourth incarnation is Narasimha. With beautiful hands, lotus-like hands, but claws that are fearsome and sharp as horn, he grabs the demon, 
takes him in, throws him across his knee, and eats his entrails. Vishnu, who holds the mace, comes as Narasimha, half man and half lion. The last incarnation, the one yet to come, when the world is filled with barbarians, he will come like a shooting star, scoop up all of the evil ones and destroy them. As Kalki, man on the white horse, he'll come. This is the incarnation yet to come. Raghu Rajpur provides a thematic link between the traditional arts in India, painting entwined with dance, which in turn is entwined with sculpture. But this village has a far more tangible connection with dance. It is the birthplace of Guru Kelucharan Mahapatra, the most important teacher and choreographer of Orissi today. He has also been Sharon Lowen's teacher for the last 10 years and will remain so for as long as she continues to dance, maybe longer. For in India, a teacher guides you not just in your vocation, but in your lifestyle as well. Kilachan Mahapatra is considered the architect of the modern Odissi style. He came from a Gotipur tradition and also has uh, the background of being from a family of traditional painters. But he has taken the classical style and done a great deal of the choreography as we see it today. He studied the temple sculptures at Kanarak. He also studied the palm leaf paintings and to some extent the cloth paintings. There's in Odissi as well as other classical forms of Indian dance, you have Shastric tradition, medieval texts about the dance that tell you how the dancer should look what steps she should take, what movements, uh, specifics about hand gestures. So based on all of this, as well as in any dance tradition, the oral tradition passed on from teacher to student, from his teachers, he uh, has, has developed the form. In India, the relationship with a student and teacher is very close. They're more like a, a mentor. It's very paternal. It's more than just someone who teaches you your basic technique. They, they get quite involved in your life. And uh, I think for the Indian dance, because it's so involved in the culture, that it's necessary to, uh, be, to learn a lot from the teacher's life. For instance, when I'm studying with my teacher in his home in Katak in Orissa, one takes part in all of the daily rituals. He has a prayer room in his house, and in the evening, there's a ritual done for the deities, and the students participate. It's important to do it because the feeling that one has, and even the actions that one does, are things that are used in the dance. One, two, three, four. Many of the gestures of Indian dance would, in the West, be categorized as mime. Some are drawn from expressions which are commonplace in India, but alien to a Westerner. But there are other, more fundamental differences between the dances of West and East. For one thing, the Western tradition, particularly ballet, aims at escaping from the earth. And most of the technique is geared to preparing the dancer to leave the earth. So you have all of the um, bending and stretching and kicking and leaping so that you can be off the ground as much as possible. In Indian dance, you stay close to the ground. That's why we can dance on cement and stone, because we're not coming down and needing that shock absorption. Another thing is that in Indian dance, you use the, the personal space around the dancer. The shapes that I create are around my body. And even though I use the space chore choreographically, it's really the space around me, going with me, that's most important. The West has influenced Orisi in one important way. The theater has replaced the temple as the main venue of the dance. But a large auditorium may make it impossible to appreciate the subtlety of Orisi's facial gestures and hand movements. 
A spectator may also be unaware that the dancer has spent three hours before the performance in the makeup room. The eyebrow should arch like Cupid's bow, the eye like a fish. Here I have the sun with the rays of the sun and the moon, and also on my silver ornament here is the sun and the moon. The jewelry is all silver. In Odyssey, we use the silver which comes from Katak. It's Katki silver, and it's all a special filigree that they use there. These flowers are made out of pith, which is the soft inside pulpy wood. And the pith is specially made. There are special craftsmen who make it. This mukut is like the spire of the temple. Then, of course, there's a lot of ornaments because the dancer is just supposed to be well ornamented and beautiful. So the decorations are from head to toe. Even on my hands, I have the sun painted. And on my feet, we paint alta, which is a red dye. And this is supposed to be auspicious and very beautiful. It's not only used in the dance, but in, um, in the villages of Orissa, you'll see the ladies wearing alta as well. In fact, when I returned to the States to be married, uh, my teacher said that I should be sure and paint my feet for my husband, and they would look like the lotus flower, and he would love them. <laughs> In a performance, we always begin with an invocation to the earth, to the deity, and to the audience. In the text, it says the difference between secular and sacred dance is whether or not one has done their invocation. After that, there will be pure dance shown, then expressional dance. These may be other items repeated. And the conclusion of a program is always the moksha, which means liberation. This is the culmination of a program where uh, the fulfillment of the dance, where the artist feels the fulfillment of hopefully achieving uh, this release through the art with the audience. This is the dance of the ten incarnations of Vishnu in its final form. Sharon was the first American chosen by the Indian government to tour the United States, and she performed this dance regularly. This piece demands the dancer's full range of emotion and expression. It also provides an introduction to India's mythology, a mythology which is not an anachronism left by a long dead civilization but the living heritage of India's vast collection of races, castes, and subcastes. Children are told these stories in over 200 languages. If India cannot find unity in her politics, she might find it in her legend. Sarva Mangala, Mangala. Yeah. Mm -hmm.